Great. So you can sit down or if you wish, and it's... Okay, so that, it's not actually up. It, oh, sorry. <laughs> oh, no. Yep, we're away. Okay, um, we're going to make a start. Oh, you have to have this thing. You can either leave it on there or put it on your WhatsApp, whatever you want. So, um, welcome, and um, I'm pleased to introduce Professor Stephen Brookhouse. So, Stephen is Professor of Professional Practice at Westminster University, the University of Westminster, uh, where he um, also runs the Part 3 course. Um, he and I um, do a lot of work for the RIBA on the Part 3 course and the CPD course. And I think, are you coming out to Hong Kong and Dubai, shall I? Uh, not Hong Kong, but Dubai. Okay, so we also examine abroad. Um, so today it's the subject of contracts. Now, I don't want you to panic over this. The questions that you get in the exam are to do with the general principles, not the nitty-gritty detail. But the ger general principles are really important because if you're renting a flat or buying a mobile phone, you'll inevitably get tied into some sort of a contract. And understanding the basic principles of those contracts is really important. Now, I've got a meeting straight after this with Stephen, so I won't be around to answer questions about your... Um, poster module, but I will be in my room from 12 till 1 today, room 103, first floor, above where Ben Dav Devereux used to be. I'll be happy to chat to anybody. Um, so I'm going to send the register around, but I'd like a, a, a new approach on the register. Can you only sign it if you're here? That would be really good. <laughs> shall I, on that note, Peter, shall I start? Right, good morning everybody. Um, as Peter said, really the, the, one of the challenges is to try and introduce you to an area of uh, English law and architectural practice that is um, fundamental to the way that we operate, but also seemingly quite conceptual to start with. Um, also contracts, by their nature, are very, very complicated. So the challenge for me in uh, trying to convey this to you is to keep it as simple as possible. So as Peter said, the, the aim here is to work on the principles, to get you to understand the principles, and then to develop that to a level of detail. If we don't get the principles right, you'll never get the detail right. Um, it's not intended that this would be a memory test as well. Um, it's, uh, we're not looking for complex um, summaries of different types of contract. Because contracts change, the contracts change daily. Um, and that includes our professional contracts and our building contracts. Um, so uh, it is therefore just, as I said, very important we get the principles right. Um, so I'm going to go through principles. We'll talk a little bit about why these things are so important, um, where the, they sit within our legal system, um, and then get into the detail of what actually makes a contract. Uh, we'll look very briefly at what, uh, what happens when things go wrong, and then right at the very end, I'll give you a summary of different types of um, uh, construction contracts and the way that that feeds into the contracts architects have with their clients, what we call professional services agreements. Um, and I'm going to do that, as you probably saw from the title, in a slightly different way. Um, I'm going to try and relate this to possibly to um, something that you'll all be familiar with. So the headline here is a contract is an enforceable agreement between different people or organisations. Um, what do we mean by that? Well, we all have agreements. In fact, we, Peter and I have just agreed to meet up afterwards. That's a, a sense that we've set up uh, some relationship immediately to discuss a number of things. Um, but nobody in their right mind is going to say, 
that's enforceable. If something went wrong, if I decided to run off or Peter did the same, we're not going to say that I need to, uh, this is so important that I, I need to make this uh, some sort of obligation. Um, but there are occasions when the sorts of agreements we make are so important that we do need them to be supported by the full force of the English legal system. Um, and in order to do that, we have to make them subject to English law. Um, that divides up into what our common law system, but also what you and I would more readily understand to be laws, um, things that are made by Parliament, Acts of Parliament. Um, and well, I would have said until the 29th of uh, March, but uh, who knows when, we're also subject to European law as well. So very, very quickly, I'll start by giving you an overview of our legal system and then we'll see where this drops in. So um, contract law is a part of our legal system. Um, so you would expect it to be aff affected by anything that relates to the laws of England and Wales. The first one is what we call common law, and we're not going to go into that in any detail, um, but it's unique to um, what we call Anglo-Saxon legal systems, the English system, most English-speaking systems, English system, American system, our Commonwealth systems as well, relate on this sort of organic, what we call common law or judge-made law. Um, and that is, uh, has the... Um, characteristic that it can adapt to changing circumstances. So it's not actually written down and made in, um, in a fixed way. It allows it to adapt to different circumstances. And we've developed that system over hundreds of years to make it a robust, transparent and public system uh, that's independent as well, I should say, independent of the state or any government control. But occasionally, or very often in the case of mature economies, mature states, we, governments, what I call steps in with legislation, what we call acts of parliament or regulations. Um, they could do that for a number of reasons, but one of them might be to protect you as consumers, as a, um, or it might be to protect human rights in some way. Um, and, that, and that's really the role of Parliament. It creates these laws that have an impact um, on the relationships we have with each other and the citizens. And then we are affected by European Union law and primarily a thing called the European Directives. Now, there aren't many directives that um, actually affect the relationships that we establish with each other, uh, that affect these, these agreements that we have. And in fact, there aren't many statutes, there aren't many acts of parliament either that affect what is essentially a private set of agreements. In fact, parliament tries to avoid um, stepping in and uh, controlling the, the agreements that we make, the contracts that we make, unless they're considered to be unfair or disproportionate in some way. Anyway, again, we don't need to worry too much about that. Um, so if we now know that contract law is part of our English legal system, where does it sit? Well, it's, if we were to think of it like a Venn diagram as such, it sits within, understandably, a thing called the law of obligations. Um, because, in a sense, that's what we're doing. We're making obligations to each other. We're making agreements or commitments. Um, we also need to... Um, as part of that law, uh, respect the rights and duties that we have to each other. Um, particularly also where no contracts exist. So this law of obligations tries to deal with the agreements that you and I would make, but also a wider sense of obligations we have to the citizens where we don't have these contractual agreements. And then, because it's a legal system, it also gives us the right to find a remedy when those agreements fail, or in some way that our rights are infringed. Um, I mentioned when I was talking about the state that actually there are very few um, interventions that, that the state makes in contract law. It's essentially considered to be a private uh, 
law, a private relationship that we establish. Yes, of course, there are some statutes, and you'll probably come across them, as Peter mentioned, your mobile phone or the agreements you have for, with the university to, to, um, to rent a, a room or, or an apartment. Um, and those are covered by particular pieces of legislation, but again, you don't need to worry about those today. I'm really just trying to show you that these are, there are some instances where the government intervenes, where Parliament intervenes, uh, primarily to protect consumers. If there's anything that's happened over the um, uh, recent years, it's that the consumer, so you and me, are dealt with uh, differently from companies. And the principle behind that is that um, uh, as consumers, we do not necessarily have perfect information. We're not specialists. But if we are professionals, if we're architects or if we're business people, we are assumed to have a better sense, a better knowledge of the obligations that we're, um, we're entering into. So there are two streams to this, one of you as a consumer um, in your professional lives, um, you as an architect or a building contractor or, or an employer. Um, um, and obviously in the context of your studies, your professional studies, um, we would be moving you away from being a consumer um, to being a professional. And there are other obligations that, that um, come from that. So I say we've, just to summarise, we've got the English legal system, the common law system, we have Acts of Parliament, things like the Supply of Goods and Services Act, um, and then we have a little bit of European law. Um, and the, I was struggling to find a piece of European law that was really relevant, um, and this one really is called the Public Procurement Directive. It relates to how we go about setting up those obligations, how we get um, uh, what are called tenders for work, um, getting quotations, prices for work, um, and how we deal with that fairly and in a transparent way, particularly in relation to public sector works. So works for the government, uh, works for the university, works for hospitals. Um, so the examples are, as I've, um, I've said there in red, and those I suppose are the key things, um, building contracts where we have an employer and a contractor, and then our professional services contracts, those, uh, those contracts between architects and their clients. I should also add that we are subject to another, as architects, we're subject to another set of rules created by the Architects Registration Board and, and the RIBA. They are not seeking to impose onerous conditions in the way that we agree our contracts, but they do set out various, various requirements. Um, again, you needn't know the detail of those, but I just want to make the point before I leave this slide that as well as the legal system, as professionals, uh, we have another layer of rules and regulations <coughs> that we need to comply with. So how do we know we've got a contract? And that's a very important question. Um, uh, um, because if we want it to be enforceable, in other words, we have the force of the English law behind it, then we, we need to have some sort of definition. Now, the English legal system being what it is, they don't like definitions very often. Um, so, uh, but what we can say is that contracts have to have particular characteristics. And I'm now going to just explain what those characteristics are, and then we'll expand this um, into a particular set of examples, and then at the end of the lecture we'll finish off with talking about a more sort of professional set of agreements. So the first thing we have to have, if we're setting up these obligations between you and me, Peter, myself, a company, and yourself, their architect and their client, a builder and um, a client such as a university who wants a building built, there needs to be some, in order to make an agreement, there has to be some transaction. First of all, there has to be an offer, and then typically there has to be acceptance. So um, 
we therefore have, a, have to have a procedure whereby there has to be these two elements. So, um, uh, so when we are looking to see whether a contract has been, in, been formed and what's in that contract, we look for what the offer was and then we look to see if it has been accepted. And that would be fine, we could agree all that. But if we left it there and nothing else happened, there would be nothing to enforce. There would be nothing that would, would have any, any sort of force behind it, um, any real relevance or meaning. So what else should we be looking for? Well, this I'm trying in this lecture to avoid legal or technical terms, but I'm afraid this next one, consideration, is about the only word that we can, uh, we can use, which is the technical term, it's the legal term. Um, but what it means is money and effort, or what I would like to say, performance. So in your offer and acceptance, the building contractor will, for example, or the designer, let's say the architect, offers to provide a set of architectural services. They offer to perform a number of services, design, advice, maybe managing the contractor. Um, that is, in a sense, their effort, their performance. And in return, your client, uh, in accepting it, accepts that they will pay you. So their performance, their consideration, is the effort of actually paying you. So you, you get remunerated, you get paid for the services that you provide. So you can see it's a transaction. Um, and you can see, obviously, you're doing that all the time when you, when you go buy, buying goods and services. So, for example, if you're renting a flat, the, um, the performance by, the, by your landlord is to provide the accommodation. And hopefully it's accommodation that's agreed in the documentation. For your part, you agree to pay on a monthly basis at an agreed sum. So can you see that's the transaction? That's the consideration. It also has to be legal um, to make it infor uh, enforceable. And you also have to have the, the capacity. So you must know your responsibilities. So this could be an agreement. So the second-hand car, um, yours for £5,995. It could be an oral agreement. You could just shake hands, but it can be written. And I should say at this point that obviously if we're looking for, a, when we realize that these obligations are so important to us, in the sense of our livelihood, we want to get paid our architect's fees, um, it's probably advisable that it is written. English law actually doesn't say it has to be. It could just be the, sh the shake of a hand. Um, but in order to create certainty, and again, the legal system should be also trying to establish certainty, it's far better if it's written. And it will come as no surprise that complex agreements, such as building contracts, should always be written. And similarly, our own agreements with our clients um, must be written. And this is where the set of rules that I mentioned a few moments ago comes in um, that, that sits above English law that says oral agreements are not enough for us, although that's acceptable. Our services are so complex, they mean so much, they're so valuable, that we have to set them out in writing. Um, and it comes as no surprise, therefore, that our, our codes of conduct um, require us to do that. So that's the agreement. As I mentioned, the, um, I suppose I've already covered this of what we mean by consideration. Its definition is an act or promise um, and what you buy the promise for. But we needn't worry too much about that. As I said, it's more about the aspect of performance, doing something and getting paid in return. So this idea of a transaction. So the building contract, as I have just to expand on that or to give you an example for future reference, the contractor agrees to build a house to your designs in return for payment. Um, and then, the, again, the idea of the architect's appointment, our agreement, we carry out a set of services and the client promises to pay us. Very simple. <coughs>
intention to create legal relations. Now, this may sound blindingly obvious, and hopefully this is not something that, that we would ever be involved with in, to, in our uh, in our day-to-day -day operations as architects. But um, the principle is, yes, you could have an agreement. Um, let's say the agreement to go and rob a bank, perhaps. Um, but you couldn't enforce it. You couldn't um, uh, say when, you've, um, when one of your... Um, one of your partners fails to perform that uh, that you're going to take them to court because they didn't do what you wanted um, because the courts would say actually what you were talking about was illegal anyway um, so the courts won't uh, enforce something that is illegal it sounds a desperately obvious thing but it again it's clearly based on on case on cases that have obviously come up um, more importantly though uh, is this idea of, did you want it to be legally binding? Um, did you want it to be um, enforceable? Um, and that's really the fundamental point. Um, and that goes back to this idea of whether you had an op, you know, whether you did make an agreement in the first place. When we move to commercial agreements, so the agreements that affect us professionally, um, it's assumed that they will be legally binding unless you say something else. And in the flurry of paperwork you get in, in the, the sort of reality of architectural practice or appointing a contractor to carry out work, um, it's sometimes unclear what you actually agreed to. Um, so if the phrase subject to contract is written at the end, it's really saying this is not a contract, this is not the agreement, this is something else. We've got to actually agree the detail before we create a contract. As you can believe, if we're looking for certainty in setting out our obligations, anything we can do to avoid ambiguity is good. And then lastly, you have to have capacity. So um, capacity really means that you, um, if you're... Um, a minor, so in other words, you're below a certain age, or if you're uh, mentally ill, um, uh, you've been induced to enter into a contract, then the courts will say, actually, that's, that's not fair, it's not valid. So again, I hope that none of you will ever get into that situation, but just for completeness, you have to have capacity. And lastly, there's another rule that I just need to introduce you to, and it's called privity of contract. Um, and that means that when you have got these obligations, because we know that they're important, we want to make them enforceable, it says you can't transfer them to somebody else. You can't say, well, I know I've agreed to do this, but I've, somebody else will now do this on my behalf. If you were to do that, you will st would still take responsibility. So if you were carrying out a design for somebody, um, and you were too busy, it turns out, and you said, oh, I'll get so-and-so to do this work for me, you might get them to do that work, but you are still responsible for their work and you are still responsible to your client through this transaction that you've created. And similarly, um, they uh, have an obligation as well, a direct obligation to you. So, in plain English, only the people named in the contract can benefit from it or be required to give the performance. Um, so, I think, um, now that may not appear, you know, that that's probably seems fairly basic, but in our case as architects, we often work in what I call a multi-party world. We're working with, in teams, we're working with contractors, other consultants, um, and sometimes it's not clear where these obligations begin and end. Um, and also, sometimes we carry out, we can carry out work on somebody else's behalf. Uh, we do that in building contracts. We work on behalf of the, of the client. It's called, we act as their agents. We eff effectively step into their shoes to carry out certain functions. Um, and again, to avoid any misunderstanding contractually, 
those, those particular things that we do have to be written down somewhere and they're written down in the contract. I should say for the purposes of uh, this course, this, this set of lectures, um, you, you probably don't need to know what these particular um, sets of obligations that we might carry out on somebody's behalf might be. But it's a detail that you need to be aware of. Okay, so that's a fly through the English uh, legal system. Um, we've looked at the law of obligations. We've uh, seen that contract law now sits within this, um, this part of the English law called the obligation, law of obligations, the obligations that we have to each other. And in this particular case, it's around contracts. We've looked at the four things that we need to, to uh, make sure that we have a contract. Um, if we don't have, if one of those is missing, then it might feel like an, a set of obligations, might feel like an agreement, but it won't be enforceable. That's the key point to make. So I'm going to just expand on this by talking a little bit about, um, by thinking about something you're all aware of, you know, going out and having a meal. And in this case, I'm just going to use a pizza as an example. Um, it could be anything else, but, um, and I suppose the starting point is that when you agree, when you decide you're going to go out to the restaurant, you can now see that actually what you're doing when you're sitting down and ordering a meal is that you're creating a set of obligations and there's a contractual set of obligations. Um, I suppose the first question is what do we want? You know, who's it for is a very important question that we, we need to always define in English contracts. Um, and obviously in this case it's reasonably obvious that it's between you and the, and the restaurant. Um, we could complicate that by saying, well, actually, if there are four of you and you're paying for everybody, you've ordering on their behalf, um, probably you're the person who is creating that set of obligations. You're the point of transaction. In a sense, you're taking responsibility. You're taking, probably taking responsibility for payment as well, possibly. Um, um, so actually, that question, who is it for, who, who are the named people who in, these, in this contract, is, is you know, fundamental. Um, more to the point, though, is what do we want? You know, what are we now, having established who we are, how do we go about um, setting out, to go back to our technical idea of performance, what is it that we're looking for the pizza parlour, the pizza restaurant to perform, to, to provide for us. And then what are we going to do in terms of performance, in terms of consideration um, for payment? Um, so, very obvious thing is if we're choosing from a menu um, and we know that there are, you know, set meals, there are standard um, uh, choices and then we can begin to add things to that. So then we can say, well, are we going to have a starter? Are we going to have sides? Are we going to have some drinks? And by the way, how much will all that uh, come up to? And our contracts, our agreements between architect and client, between the building contractor and our client, um, work the same way. Um, uh, an example might be for our professional services contracts as architects. We have a menu, and I think we do often call it a menu of services that we provide. And there are what are called standard services, so a little bit like your standard meal. And then there are additional services that we can provide, so optional extras we might call. So this, this, this is quite a sort of powerful analogy between going out and having a meal and looking at the menu and looking at the sides, looking at the other things. Um, and it's only when, of course, those are written down, and of course that's when the waiter comes up and they make a note and they add all these things and say, do you want this, do you want that, um, that we begin to define exactly what it is that we want. 
And of course, we've probably all been in that situation where we thought we've uh, ordered something and it didn't turn up, or the wrong thing turns up, or the drinks don't turn up and we ordered them. Um, uh, so you can see, even at this very basic level, there is scope for misunderstandings and people's non-performance, if you want to call it that, on particular aspects. Um, so, and, and then what is that going to cost? How does all that add up? That's another factor. The other question you might ask is, when will I get it? So I talked a little bit about performance in terms of services that we provide and clients making payments to us. Um, but actually, the time performance, how quickly something appear, will appear, is also important. Curiously enough, that isn't really written down in our restaurant example, and it's not often um, very clear in our professional services agreements. It is in a building contract because we say when the work will start and when it's going to be completed. We're, those dates are defined. But you can see that when we're going out for a, for a meal, that those time periods are not, you know, not written down. There may be something that says we're going to, you know, from the time you sit down, we will deliver your food in 15 minutes. And you might see that in some sort of fast food outlet. Um, um, but you do know that there's a level of expectation that you have about when something will arrive. Um, and then sometimes, of course, we need to be able to change things um, uh, or add things and take them away. So we can, there has to be provision to adapt and change the contract. And so just the same way as when you're going out and ordering a meal, building contracts, our agreements with our clients have to have that capacity as well to be able to adapt to, to change what we call a variation. Okay, so um, I've touched a little bit on oral or written, um, but we need to manage those expectations in order to get the right contract, and we can only do that by being clear about what is required. So I think I've touched on a fair amount of this, but just to summarise that, you know, we expect to get what we ordered. So I've dwelt quite a lot on you know, writing down what it is we want from the menu that we're going to get in a particular way. Um, if we were to, to use a technical term to move that into a building contract, we would be talking about a specification. I don't call menus a specification, but effectively that's what we're doing. We're specifying what it is we want. Um, we know also that there will be a definition. It will be, um, in terms of a restaurant, we predefine what it is we're going to pay. It would be a bit strange if you went in um, to a pizza restaurant and you didn't actually know how much it was going to cost. There is an expectation that you will know exactly what it's going to cost for the services or the products they're going to provide. Um, and that cost is, again, to, to transfer this into a building contract terms, is what we call the contract value. So we can see that writing down from the menu and writing down your order and how that's tailored could be you know, the specification, the specific requirements you have. Um, and then we can abstract from the menu exactly what that's going to cost. And as I said to you, we would expect that to happen in a reasonable time. Um, uh, there is probably no definition of what a reasonable time means unless it's set down, as I said, you know, we'll deliver this within 15 minutes. If they haven't, then effectively they failed in a particular aspect of, of their performance. 